Hello and welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, hi, you're very welcome. This is Reading the Past and I'm Dr Cat. Today's video is, I suppose, a follow-on from one that I made previously. I made a video on the development of the Bible in English, which I'm going to link up here. In that video, I talk about how vital this development of an English Bible was for shaping our international, national, linguistic and, of course, religious identity in this country. However, for many decades, the Bible in English was paired with another text, and I think that that text was equally vital for shaping our identity. And it's that text that I want to talk about today. In 1563, John Day prints the first English edition of John Fox's Acts and Monuments. This text was later, and I would argue now, better known as Fox's Book of Martyrs. The English edition is enormous. It's around about 1,500 pages of folio text. And as you can see here from the frontispiece of the text, clearly it's intended for display. This is not a text to be hidden away. It's something that you are proud to own. But this was not always the case. Indeed, Fox had begun working on his history of the Protestant faith during the reign of Edward VI in around about 1552. Perhaps he was encouraged by that king's reformist tendencies, thinking that such a history would find favour with his monarch. However, as we know, Edward VI was not to be a long-lived king. And after his death, his staunchly Catholic half-sister, Mary I, came to the throne. Perhaps, fearing for his life, certainly for his personal and professional security, Fox flees England. During his European exile, Fox publishes the first draft in Latin of any of the Acts and Monuments. This section deals with the persecution of the Lollards. It's printed in Strasbourg in 1554. Next up, he deals with the persecution of Protestants in Mary's England in another Latin volume, this one printed in Basel in 1559. However, by the time of this text being printed, another monarch has risen to the throne of England. This time, it's Elizabeth I, Edward and Mary's half-sister, and she, like her brother, is more reformist in nature. It would seem that Fox saw this turn of events as a sign, a hopeful one. Perhaps his text could finally find the approval of the English monarchy. And so, evidently, he sets to work. The two Latin versions that he has printed in Europe have expanded considerably in the space of seemingly four years to create this enormous, beautiful English version. Fortunately for John Fox, it seems he supposed correctly because Elizabeth I, her government, and most critically, the Church of England of which she was the supreme governor, did approve the message of his text. So much so that in the convocation of April 1571, it was ordered that Fox's Acts and Monuments should be placed alongside the Bible in English in churches and cathedrals and in a number of clerical households. It should be made available in this way for people to look at it. And to understand the magnitude and reach of this, I would like to have a look at a selection of woodcut images from Acts and Monuments. Although literacy was on the uptick, it wasn't universal. And so having images like these that so clearly and evocatively depict the sufferings of Protestants as they hoped to support and protect their faith must have been striking. So let's look at some of these woodcuts. Some of the images that I'm about to show you are incredibly disturbing. And for that reason, I'm issuing a content warning. They may not be suitable for all audiences. I'm going to put a timestamp in the video now. So if you want to skip ahead and avoid seeing that, please do so. This woodcut image shows the burning of Thomas Cranmer during the reign of Mary I. He had recanted his reformist faith and this should have been enough to save him from the flames. But perhaps motivated for vengeance for the part he played in the dissolution of her parents' marriage, Mary I was not satisfied with this. She demanded that he be burnt for his crimes against her faith. And so we see him here inserting the hand that signed his recantation into the flames so that it should burn first. 
It is undeniably a powerful and evocative image. Cranmer had stumbled. He had recanted his faith, perhaps out of the fear of the agonies of the fire. However, he came back to that faith. And in a final act of defiance, he shows himself a martyr, burning the hand that had offended against his God. This image shows the burning of Anne Askew, and she was tortured in the Tower of London before her burning. I mentioned her in my video on torture, which I'm going to link above. She is an exceptional case and a fitting person to add to a martyrology, because despite the torture and the threat of burning, which, as we see, is being carried out, she does not name names. She keeps the people who her interrogators wish her to implicate safe from a similar fate. It is conceivable to me that any person looking at this image and knowing her history would have viewed Anne Askew as both a martyr and a hero who defended the Protestant faith. Here is William Tyndale being grotted before being burned. Tyndale is of course famous for being the creator of the first printed Bible in English, so perhaps it is fitting that a woodcut of him features in a text that would end up being placed next to the Bible in English of which he was one of the originators. The sufferings endured by Cuthbert Simmons are depicted here, the various and imaginative torture methods used against him. For me, and I'm sure for many of you, the most disturbing image in this collection is this one. Pictured are a group of women being burnt at the stake. One of the women has clearly been pregnant before she was burnt. The baby has emerged from her during this burning process. The story goes that the baby was taken by the people executing her and thrown back into the flames. The idea alone is grotesque, but having this represented in image form is somehow even more disturbing, if that's possible. And indeed, in the case of all of the woodcuts in this collection, the way in which these events are represented are visceral in the extreme. Big, fat curls of flame seem to dance and lick around the feet of their victims as plumes of choking smoke emerge around them. In certain cases, we have speech emerging from the mouth of the person being burnt. We can read their last words. We can see their faces that might be filled with pain or fear or even the resolution to suffer for their faith. And surrounding them are witnesses. Some will look horrified, some appear to be almost gleeful. And I think it transports us as viewers there in a way that arguably text alone could not. In addition to the images of torment and horror, there are other politically and polemically interesting images in this collection. This one, for example, where Elizabeth I is figured as Constantine the Great, the founder of Constantinople and the Roman emperor who converted to Christianity and spread that faith across his empire. By figuring Elizabeth as Constantine, it is saying that perhaps she too has a religious and imperial journey ahead of her, that she may similarly be a converting and imperial force for change. At the start of this video, I made some pretty bold claims about just how important Fox's Book of Martyrs was to the shaping of early modern English identity. And I suppose I better back that up. For me, it's principally about accessibility. The fact that the convocation ruled that this book should be placed alongside the Bible in English in all churches and cathedrals is important. Fox's text, with its violent woodcut images, is being placed in locations where attendance is mandatory. If you don't turn up to your local church on the appropriate days, then you face the censure of your community, but also the fines and suspicion of your government. And perhaps the fact that you are in this place, because you have to be, and this text is also there, might shape your mindset. If you are being presented with this polemic about how Protestantism is the faith of the martyr, one that suffers in the face of the Catholic Church, then you might look around you at your neighbours and friends. Who isn't in church? Who is perhaps behaving in ways that could arguably point to them being crypto-Catholic? Who might be a threat to the faith of your nation and for your queen? Who might be plotting with Catholics to bring down the monarchy and return England to Rome? Maybe 
you are more inspired to speak out against those people who you suspect. Equally, you might cast your eye beyond England. You might look at the New World and the colonies that are being planted by Portugal and Spain, and you might worry for those people. With these incursions by Catholic nations, are the indigenous population under a similar threat? Perhaps you may be inspired to support, either financially or with your own person, journeys to discover, explore and create Protestant plantations in the New World. I think the more modern equivalent of this impetus of protection is visible in missionary work that occurs all over the world. When a person of faith believes that their particular denomination is the one that preserves and saves, of course they may be inspired to go out and do that preserving and saving in places where they think the threat is. We must never forget that this preserving or saving work doesn't always work out that well for the indigenous population that these people view as being under threat, of course. In short, Fox's Book of Martyrs for me is providing impetus for protectionism from Catholics at home and also overseas. It helps to shape a national, spiritual, political and imperial identity that is based on an act of faith. And that is why I view Fox's Book of Martyrs as being so important. It is for me a cornerstone in the shaping of early modern England's identities and therefore it is equally a foundation for our own. I'd love to know what you think, so do let me know in the comments section down below or come and find me over on my social media. I'll be leaving the links to that in the description box. You can follow me there and we can continue the conversation. I do hope you've enjoyed this video and found it useful. If you did, please let me know by giving it a thumbs up. Please also subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon so that YouTube tells you when I've next uploaded. I hope you're gonna have a great day, whatever you're doing, and I look forward to speaking to you all in my next video. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye for now.